We're going to do now with the Old Testament what we did previously in the assembly in the New Testament by giving some great Old Testament verses that form the basis and background for many New Testament references too. A lot of times if we can get the gist of a section of scripture such as the Old or New Testament, everything will blend together and fit together. The New Testament is the most uh, cogently outlined treatise in the history of the world. The life of Christ and how to become a Christian and how to live the Christian life and then how to die as a Christian. That's the outline of the New Testament. The Old Testament said Christ is coming and it says it early in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 is the first main reference. Uh, Jehovah told the devil the seed of woman would crush the devil's power. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4 4 says. But Genesis 3.15 is the background of the Messiah coming through the seed of woman. Elsewhere in the Bible and in history, it's always the seed of man. But uniquely, the Messiah comes through the seed of woman. And that's Genesis 3.15. And unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, Isaiah 9, six. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Uh, passages from Isaiah 9, 6, and fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 when Jesus was born. And the place for that birth, Micah 5, 2, in Bethlehem of Judea, fulfilled when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Also Matthew chapter 1. And then Genesis 22:18 is in many ways the basis of uh, the New Testament, the coming of Christ. To Abraham... Jehovah said, uh, Because thou hast obeyed my voice, and thee and thy seed uh, shall the Messiah, the Savior, come. And that's exactly what happened. Also Matthew chapter 1 and other passages. And then Genesis 49.10, Out of all the tribes, the tribe of Judah was selected as the one who would produce the Prince of Peace, the bringer of peace, Shiloh. And that's fulfilled when Christ was born, and angels said, Peace on earth among men in whom he's well pleased. Uh, Luke 2.14 It is evident our Lord sprang out of Judah Hebrews 7.14 So in the first book of the Bible Genesis The beginning We have the three main passages That encompass the entire 39 Old Testament books The preservation of Abraham's seed Who would be born of a virgin And he would come from the tribe of Judah So those have to be outstanding blockbuster verses In the opening stands of the Bible The book of Genesis Which means the beginning So God had a plan starting even before the world began, but really being initiated the moment sin entered the world through the ploys of Satan. And then the passage our brother read from Isaiah 53 explains uh, some more background. Have you ever thought of what the phrase means in Isaiah 53, he'll come as a root out of dry ground? Well, first of all, born of a virgin. And uh, he didn't come from the right tribe as they thought of it. He came as a root out of a dry ground, born of a virgin, and from a wrong tribe as far as the Jews were concerned. But heaven had its own plan. But Isaiah 53 mentions also that we didn't desire him because he was handsome or comely. It didn't mean he was ugly. It simply meant we desired him for his spiritual valor and strength. And that ought to give us a clue as to the nature of Christianity. It's not based upon physical beauty or prowess, but upon the intensity of, of purity and divine uh, arrangement. Isaiah 53 said, Jehovah laid on him the iniquity of us all. Though he never sinned, he bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. 1 Peter 2, 24. Isaiah 53 also says that uh, this one who is going to be born of a virgin and come as a root out of a dry ground will defeat Satan so that the spoils will not all belong to the devil. From the time sin entered the world till Christ conquered sin in a sinless life, uh, sin and death had had the dominance over man but no longer will satan get all the spoils he'll have to divide them with christ and though he's strong he's not as strong as christ so isaiah 53 has a lot of pertinent information that's brought out in the 27 new testament books he bore our sins his own body upon the tree jehovah laid on him the iniquity of us all by his stripes were healed according to first peter 2 24 and 25 so a lot of these Old Testament passages are just background references for the coming of Christianity. And that's what overwhelmed Satan. Christ lived and died without sin. 
left a gospel plan of salvation that can overwhelm the ploys of the devil. And so the devil knew that he had been defeated. And that's why he trembles, James 2.19. But I want us now to focus in on Jeremiah 31. And you might turn to that in the Old Testament, right in the middle of the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31. But also keep your place at Hebrews 8, which quotes this in fulfillment and shows the application of it. I suppose there's never been a prophecy so well structured and so divinely fulfilled as Jeremiah 31. Now Isaiah 53 says the Messiah is coming, but he has to have a covenant through which he operates. And that's prophesied over 100 years after Isaiah's prophecy in 53, Isaiah 53. It's an interesting thing how that in uh, Jeremiah 31, he tells the nature of this new covenant, that it will not be at all like the old covenant written on tables of stone for the Jews alone, inherited by physical birth. See, that's what shut the Gentiles out of that arrangement, is that uh, uh, the old covenant was given for the lost sheep of the house of Israel for Abraham's seed to those he led out of Egypt by the house of bondage. Never was given to Gentiles. But the new covenant was given for all mankind and you don't inherit it by physical birth. We all stand on level ground. Now let's notice Jeremiah 31 beginning with verse 31. There has to be a covenant that implements what the Messiah brings to the world. Wasn't enough for him to come. There had to be a covenant, an arrangement between God and man through which men can be saved by Christ in the new covenant. So about uh, 640 years before Christ, Isaiah said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob or Judah. They'll no longer be under that Ten Commandment covenant that he gave them when he led them out of bondage. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 20 gives you the Ten Commandments. And it's given to those he led out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Like a husbandman tends to a vineyard in charge of what the owner tells him to do. So the old covenant was administered to those he led out of Egypt out of the house of bondage. But there's a new covenant coming, and it will not be like that one. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people and Moses came down from the mount with the ten commandments the very first one was being disobeyed by Aaron and the people that danced around a golden calf that he and the people had made and so they're already breaking the first command of the ten commandments worshiping some other God made with their own hands and incidentally it was a God they'd learned to worship down in Egypt from whence they'd been delivered by the power and grace of God. But they will revert to that idol worship, that pagan worship they got acquainted with and familiar with uh, in uh, Old Testament days and in the land of Egypt. Now notice, and this is one of the most difficult ones, parts of this covenant, new covenant, for some people to see. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Well, I forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And so people say, well, under the great commission of the new covenant, we're to preach the gospel to every creature in every nation. But this says they'll no longer teach their neighbor. Isn't there a contradiction there? No. He's simply meaning that the Jews inherited by physical birth the old covenant just being born into Judaism. Later they had to be taught they were under that covenant. But to be under the new covenant, you have to be taught to be a part of it so you don't teach them know the Lord. They had to know the Lord to be a part of it. For instance, we, are, we do not inherit Christianity by physical birth. I can't say my mother and dad were Christians, therefore I'm automatically a Christian. In order to be a Christian, I had to already have been taught the gospel plan of salvation and obey it to be a part of the new covenant. So there's no more special favoritism to any group of people. The Jews inherited the old covenant of a physical birth and later had to be taught, hey, did you know you were part of this old covenant? Christianity is not like that. You have to be a Christian. Obey the gospel to be added to this kingdom. So he's simply saying there'll be differences in not written on tables of stone but on the heart, not for the Jews only but all mankind, not inherited by physical birth but by the new birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus under Judaism in order 
enter my kingdom, you must be born again of water and spirit. And uh, so it is a teaching covenant. Distinctions written upon the heart, not on tables of stone. Not for the Jews alone, but all mankind. Not inherited by physical birth, but by the spiritual birth, the new birth. And your sins forever forgotten. Now let's prove that by reading the fulfillment of it in Hebrews chapter 8. Keep your place there and turn to Hebrews 8 in the New Testament, which shows the contradistinction between the old and the new and the superior blessings of the new, and just takes this uh, the heart of the old covenant that the Jews previously lived under and show the difference in the new. We'll start with verse uh, 6 of Hebrews 8. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. The key word in Hebrews is better. Much more than. Much better. All the way through Hebrews. Established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, but finding fault with them. And remember, a covenant is between two parties. Nothing wrong with God. Something wrong with the people under that first covenant. Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Jacob, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. To be a part of this covenant, you have to know the Lord to be a part of it. Back then you inherited it and later had to, been, had to be taught you were a part of it. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which waxeth or decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So he's saying these Hebrew Christians trying to revert to Judaism, that covenant's dead. It's been supplanted, superseded, replaced by a new covenant, a new and living way through the veil of his flesh, Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. So when you read one of the high documents of the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, it's consummated in the death of Christ, the shedding of his blood, which ushered in the New Testament, Matthew 26, 28. So we live under a much, much better arrangement. And these Old Testament passages are just figures that point to the true, the real. They are a mirror that reflects into really New Testament Christianity. Then another passage which you've heard all your life if you've been a member of the church very long, Daniel 2.44, where Daniel down in Babylonian captivity sees this great image or tells the king the image that he saw what it means. His wise men and yes men uh, didn't know. They were false prophets. They couldn't see past their nose. Many times the prophet is called the seer, S-E-E-R, something he can see. He see. He's a seer, a seer of things to come. And so Daniel, the true prophet of God, said, I'll tell you what it means. And what he told the king was not something favorable to hear. He said, thou, O king, are the head of gold. Babylon was represented in that image with the gold. After that, the Medo-Persian Empire, labeled as silver in that image. And then a third dominion that came along, the uh, Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great, uh, brass, and then uh, another part brass and iron mingled. He said, I'll tell you what it means. You, Babylon, represents the head of gold, then the Medo-Persian Empire that will follow, then the brassy young general Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire, and then the fourth is the one that supersedes and conquers Greece, and in the days of those kings, and history tells us, and the Bible tells us, it's the Roman Empire. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom. It will break in pieces all these other kingdoms. It will never be destroyed. It will stand forever. So Acts 2, when the church of our Lord, the kingdom of God's dear son, was established in the days of the fourth worldwide dynasty, Daniel's prophecy, some 550 years old, came to fulfillment and fruition. So this has to be another blockbuster Old Testament passage. But Isaiah 2 and Joel 2 and Micah 4 all teach the same thing from a different standpoint. All nations will flow into it. The law of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. 
It'll be a kingdom of peace, not of carnal warfare. When you add all of those together, the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 was looking forward to the fulfillment of Joel 2, Daniel 2, and Isaiah 2, all fulfilled in Acts 2. And so we're members of a sovereign empire, and Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords over it, as we'll learn tonight in Revelation 17. And he's been ruling ever since he came to earth and defeated Satan. But then to get a practical, pertinent, ethical statement that's the zenith of all Old Testament writings, I would choose Micah 6, 8. He has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. The highest ethic you'd ever find. Even thou shalt love the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It doesn't supersede that in ethical brilliance. So in Old Testament days, the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Did you know that not far from here in a religious seminary in Dallas, uh, they're teaching that there was the God of the Old Testament and a different God of the New Testament? That just isn't true. The highest ethical standard you could ever find in Old or New Testament as far as ethics is Micah 6, 8. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. In other words, you need to love God supremely and your fellow man properly and thoroughly and yourself in the image of God to esteem yourself properly, not over esteem or under esteem. One of the big problems in the psychological world today is that some people think so little of themselves they never get anything accomplished. They bring the world down to their level and they don't think they're worth anything, so they think the world is worthless. And when people get to thinking like that, they'll be like Hitler. And uh, that uh, whatever you do to anyone else, it doesn't make any difference. There are no ethical standards to follow. So we live in a world that says there is no God, and if there is no God, then what Hitler did was just a choice, a matter of choice. There are no ethical standards. And when we become as corrupt and warlike as people of the past were, why shouldn't the same thing happen to us? Those who live with the sword will perish with the sword, Revelation 13.10. When we think that we can just uh, mow people down in the name of Americanism or whatever else it is, we're not thinking very clearly. He has showed the old man what is good, what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. And Jesus says, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Romans 12 says, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Therefore, anyone who is a warmonger doesn't fit into that niche. We need to be people of peace with the Prince of Peace and the Gospel of Peace as our shield and sword. And Romans 10, 15 says Christ's Gospel is a symbol of peace. We destroy our enemies by making them friends of Christ. And then Micah 7, 18 and 19 is one of the richest statements on remission of sins in all the Bibles in the Old Testament. It tells what God's desire is. He desires to cast our sins into the depths of the sea. He's never wanted anyone to be lost, but all to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. All come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. When you put together all these Old Testament passages, you see the ethical standard of godliness. You see the new covenant superseding the old. You see the Messiah coming to replace all of the animal sacrifices. And you see the way we're to live before God. Now I'd like for you to turn with me back to Psalm 78 and Psalm 106, which are historical psalms. They go back over a lot of Old Testament history. And I don't believe you'll ever find a passage that tells the story of God's goodness and mercy and grace and love and the people's absolute indifference. We're going to also add, if we have time, Psalm 86. Psalm 78, Psalm 86, Psalm 106. Historical psalms that tell much of the summary of Old Testament history. And the main thing that Psalm 78 does is show how good God was even to people who deserved not His goodness. And how He continued to extend His mercy and pa compassion and love toward them while they turned their back upon Him. In fact, I think Psalm 78, 41 is the gist of all of these historical psalms. They limited the Holy One of Israel. And that's what sin always does. Uh, verse 56 of Psalm 78. They tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies. 
verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I believe the greatest passage in the Bible of what a shepherd ought to be, and that would apply to elders today since they're shepherds. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. That's what real leadership is. Uh, integrity. Skill. That's the successful shepherd is the one who can do that. But let's start with verse 1 of Psalm 78. And remember, Psalm 86 and Psalm 106, if we don't get to those here, we need to read them later today. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Consider the days of old. Tell it the next generation, Psalm 77, 5. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He had done. For He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. This is over and over in Psalms and in the Bible as well elsewhere, that parents are to tell the truth, teach and read and study with them the Holy Word of God. And parents who fail to do that pay the sad dividends. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their, their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. See, today we live in an age, even among members of the church, that say we don't have to be commandment keepers. We can just love the Lord and gently walk with Him down the road. And that's all we need to do. Well, the psalmist was mistaken, and the Holy Spirit that inspired him to write these words must have been. The truth is, these liberals uh, are the ones who are making the mistake. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set that not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, bring armed, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. In other words, they were cowards in this warfare, and now it's a spiritual warfare against Satan and sin. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. That sounds like a critique on modern society, the United States of America, and we wonder why we're going to hell on a banana peeling. I never will understand how the kind of noise that people call music today ever got a foothold in our society. How loud can you be? How vulgar can you be? How unspiritual can you be? And do it real loudly. Beat the drums and blow the trumpets. Make it loud and obnoxious. And that's what it is. Very little music today. Just a lot of noise. None of it edifying. None of it upbuilding. If you listen to the words carefully, if you're not already deaf, it says, revile the government, persecute the people in charge, rebel against all authority, do your own thing. And most, most of the motion picture industry inculcates all that into their motion pictures today, too. I remember one of the last articles that uh, Ann Landers wrote, and I used to read that about once a month when a heading seemed to be good. She said, I never thought I'd live to see the world that is so trashy that... Uh, is so loud and boisterous and braggadocio and where people dress uh, clear out of style or trying to be neat and so forth. Just see how tacky they can be. So that's not the world I inherited, but it's the world I'm going out of. And I really agree with an awful lot of what she said on that. Other things I didn't. Anytime she touched on marriage, divorce, or remarriage, she's 180 degrees against the Bible. But on that, I believe she told the truth. We live in a time where decorum and proper dress and things of that nature have just gone down the drain. And we seem to relish it. We rebel against anything that has authority or neatness or kindness or quietness in it. And a lot of that happened in Old Testament days. They snubbed their nose at God. They left Egyptian bondage through His grace and mercy and then out halfway out in the wilderness they wanted to turn back. Everything they picked up there they wanted to redo in the golden calf incident. They borrowed that from what they worshipped down in Egypt. That was the idol they worshipped. 
They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His laws and forget His works and wonders that He had showed them. Verse 12 says, Marvelous things did He in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as in a heap. And Exodus 14, 14, they said, Our God will deliver us. Our God will fight for us. And He did. Verse 14, In the daytime also He led them with a cloud. And all the night with a light of fire. Read the book of Exodus when they left Egypt headed toward the promised land. He clave the rocks in wilderness and gave them drink as out of great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. They said, let's make us a captain to lead us back to Egypt. Numbers 14.4. They provoked the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. And you remember how he gave them so much quail they begged for it to be taken away. Couldn't be satisfied. Couldn't be pleased. Let's notice now something else. Let's start with verse 22. Because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent the meat to the full. God was gracious. They were complaining. God was kind. They were hateful. God was generous. They were spiteful. Notice 29. So they did eat and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Rebellious men had sin to sin, Hosea 13, 2. They sinned more and more, Isaiah 30, verse 1. So in spite of his goodness to them, they turned back. Now notice verse 35. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. First Thessalonians 2, 5 says flattery is sinful. We're to give honor to whom honor is due, Romans 13, 7. We're not to flatter anybody. But when you flatter somebody, you're trying to get on their good side. You're not sincere. For their heart was not right with him, verse 37, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, destroyed them not. Yet many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath, which he had enough to be angry about. Verse 41, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now let's turn to Psalm 86. This is one of the most beautiful of all the Psalms. It has in it a combination of His compassion and their feebleness spiritually. Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy, O thou my God. Save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto the Lord do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O God, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. That's one of the most beautiful psalms of all. Now let's turn to the 106th Psalm. Well, another one of the historical psalms. You know, Psalm 78 reviewed what happened in the wilderness, and how God fed them in the wilderness, and gave them light and protection, water, quail, and so forth, and still they complain. Well, here's another of what you would call an historical psalm. 
Psalm 106. Praise ye the Lord. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit we with me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Looked like they were going to perish, and here comes Pharaoh and his army chasing them. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed, many, redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. See, they've been murmuring, complaining, wanting to go back to Egypt. Now their life is saved, barely, but it is saved. Now they want to praise him. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Hosea 13, 11 said he gave them a king and his anger took him away in his wrath. And we, did, we do need to learn here that we better watch what we ask God for. We might just get it. James and John in Mark 10 and Matthew 20 parallel. One to sit on his right hand. One of them on the right hand, one on the left. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. My kingdom is one of suffering. You don't know what you've asked for. But they both got the request. And it meant death for James by the sword. And isolation on the Isle of Patmos for John. Revelation 1. They got near the Lord and his kingdom. meant death and suffering. He granted them their request but sent leanness into their souls. So we need to be very, very careful that we ask for spiritual things. These are great passages. Notice verse 19. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Broke the very first commandment in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, by worshiping an idol it barred from Egyptian lore, and it angered God. They didn't learn their lessons very well. Notice something about Moses in verses 32 and 33. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so they went ill with Moses for their sakes, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake ill-advisedly with his lips. That's one reason he didn't enter the promised land. He railed against God because they pushed him so far. He allowed men to get him to be unkind toward God and disobey God. Have you ever said, look what they made me do? If I hadn't run with that crowd, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been in a better place, a better time doing better things. But Moses, who was such a great man and for most of his life a wonderful, powerful, incomparable leader, didn't enter the promised land himself because he spoke in advisedly with his lips. He let human pride and trying to please the people or obey them instead of God cause him to be kept out of the promised land. And that's really a uh, the drama and sorrow that fills much of the Old Testament where good men allowed evil men to cause them to go with evil. And in this lifetime, to take a stand for truth and never compromise isn't easy. And to find others that will walk with you or with me or with us in the road of truth and never compromise is also difficult because we love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's the lesson that we need to learn early in life. Am I going to take a stand for the Lord and His church and His word and His people? Or am I going to compromise with the world so they'll praise me and give me the plaudits of humanity? It isn't easy to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And that's the lesson you learn from the Old Testament. Wednesday night or tonight, I haven't fully decided. I believe it would be Wednesday night. My last lesson with you, I'm going to share with you lessons I've learned from 55 years of Bible study. Things the Bible has taught me over half a century that I believe will be helpful to other people. Certainly been helpful to me. But it's not something I have invented or discovered. It's something I've learned from Bible study. And that ought to be profitable to all of us. I'd like for you to bring pencil and paper tonight just in case I decide to do that tonight instead of Wednesday night. Otherwise, read chapter 17, 18, and 19 of Revelation as we continue and we'll conclude 
this series of studies.